are we really all old souls? There are souls amongst us who are here for the first time. There are some young souls, there are some old souls. You get to be an old soul through just reincarnation. Reincarnation explains everything. For most old souls, you're going to have been bouncing back and forth between here and the astral plane. It's a journey from fear to love, from a place of me to we. We have the power to create change in our lives. We always have the ability to shape the journey. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wondered if you're an old soul and what in the world that means, then do we have the Old Souls Guidebook show for you. Today I'll be talking with Ainsley McLeod, a former skeptic, the reluctant psychic, and the author of several brilliant books on old soul wisdom, including the Old Souls Guidebook. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about how to tell if you're an old soul, and if so, why you're here, why your past lives matter, and what you're meant to do. That plus we'll talk about ghosts at 16, an uncle on Kauai, San Francisco calling, kitty lily and pet tiger, why in the world surf and turf was created, and what in the world Chester Cheetah, gotcha, has to do with anything. <laughs> So welcome to the show, Ainsley. Are you ready to shine? I am. I am so ready. Yes. What a wonderful introduction. You've certainly read my book. I can tell. Excellent. And it's a beautiful book. So almighty. Woohoo. So before we dive right into things, have we all been here before? Everyone who listens in uh, to you is going to have been here before. You're, you're an old soul and you're going to attract old souls. There are souls amongst us who are here for the first time. Um, you may not run into them if you're an old soul, but uh, you, you, people who are drawn to this kind of subject tend to be much older souls. They've been around the block a, a lot. And uh, they're looking for a deeper connection, looking for something you know, more spiritual, like, a, like just a deeper understanding of the world. So if I was to ask the question, are we really all old souls? I would say there are some young souls, there are some old souls. Well, what you're talking about is, is energy, frequency. It's a, the term that you do talk about, resonance, like attracting like. That people who are not resonating at, I'll call it a frequency, whatever we want to call it. And this isn't about levels to me, about good or bad or better or worse. But if they're not resonating at this frequency, they're going to be exit stage left. Yeah. They're just not going to be interested. Uh, you know, conversely, those people who are, you know, vibrating at the same level, they are going to be drawn. You know, they're going to find a truth in stuff that you and I would talk about. So what exactly is an old soul, Aisley? Okay, so you get to be an old soul through just reincarnation. Reincarnation explains everything. It, it's how we, how we learn about life on the, on the physical plane. You know, we're all souls. We come here from kind of out there somewhere we come in. For most old souls, you're going to have been bouncing back and forth between here and the astral plane, which is your sort of temporary residence. You know, you, you come here for a lifetime, you, you go to the astral plane to process and plan for the next life and then back again. And you'll have been doing that for maybe five or 6,000 years if you're a very old soul. That's roughly how long it takes to get through the number of lives that you need to really just learn what it is to be human. And it's a, it's a journey from, uh, from kind of uh, fear to love, from um, a place, I always say, of, of me to we. And so that's generally how you can tell the difference between a younger and an older soul. Is like the, the older soul tends to be more aware of our connection, you know, that we're, we're all one. I mean, that's the, you know, ultimately, that's what you're learning. I mean, it's, it, it really is about learning about love. And uh, that the the other person is no different from you. I mean, imagine if you've if you've had 120 lifetimes in all different um, settings, all different parts of the world, all these different scenarios. It it teaches you that the uh, I don't know the 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 housewife in Mumbai is no different to the CEO in New York or or whatever. That we're all souls beneath the the surface. So actually, one of the signs 
uh, of being a very old soul. You're a level 10 soul. It's the 10 levels and all. You're right at the end of the journey, by the way. The major sign of being such an old soul is acceptance of others. It's like in the sense of, you know, you know, younger souls have such a, uh, they have such a problem with uh, skin color. They see big, big difference, differences between genders. Um, they see the differences. What the old soul does, they see the commonality. They see that we're really all all one. So that acceptance of others is the that's the major sign. Thank you. And and I want to dive into more. We'll dive into a little bit more of my story later on. We'll get to play. But I want to play for everybody here. How can we tell? And then I want to go to where exactly we came from. But how can we tell or what are the signs of where we are on the spectrum of new soul to old soul? Well, each level, like I say, there's 10 levels. Um, the first five are as a young soul. Second five is an old soul. And the big difference between a young soul and an old soul is when you when you you kind of almost flip. It's like a 180 degree flip uh, at the end of level five, where you go from this more self interested place to being more aware of that connection that, and that we're we're all in it together. There's greater introspection. Younger souls they don't have that same ability than or interest even in introspection. You can kind of identify the first few levels are just well imagine the first level is just about getting used to being here in a in a physical body and you just come into the, to the world. You don't want anything too complex to deal with. You're not going to come in your first life um you know in in a big city for example and having to deal with complexity of life. You know, you just want something really quiet, village life, rural probably somewhere. It's just nice and easy and just getting used to figuring out who you are and what it is to be human. And then it's about sort of over the next couple of levels about try to expand a little bit, getting used to um, building communities and so on. Uh, there's a lot of fear. Younger souls have all this fear. It's why we have the wars we do and um, all the, the sort of unkindness and, and so on. You hit level five. This is where souls are really pushing outwards. And unfortunately, there's still young souls but they think they know it all. Uh, and you'll see that in so many world leaders, level five souls who um, are, they, they are the ones who are more power hungry. Um, they, they don't know their limitations. They don't know what they don't know. Um, I'm thinking of Trump, Putin, and all those, that, that crowd. These are young souls who really have no you know, in an old soul world, they, these are not the, the best leaders. We and, and, and my in immediate reaction and maybe this is the old soul in me is how much love can i send them how much can i help to heal their heart how much can i help them on their journey which helps all of us yes i mean i i, I know people get very angry with them um as my spirit guides the ones I, I work with say they're they're more to be pitied than reviled and uh, they are just very very broken souls um so you, you go from that stage, level six, that's where a lot of uh, souls are kind of, they, they're learning um, more, more of these old soul values, the, the importance of uh, equality, peace, truth, love, understanding. Level seven is all about creativity and innovation. That's where great inventors, a lot of great artists are. Level eight is about really uh, developing relationships. Uh, level nine is about exploring spirituality. And level 10, it could be anything you want. It's whatever you as an old soul feel gives you meaning. But it's very important as you get to, re to be a really old soul that you do what gives your life a sense of purpose. It's the level 10 soul, person like you, who would you know, give up that great career in Wall Street where people are going, how could you give it up? You make so much money. It looks so great from the outside to, to be a painter or something, you know, like just to, to do something that's more personal. Uh, that's sort of in a nutshell, but you know, with uh, with all sorts of variations, because so much there's so many other factors that play into it. A long time ago, in a distant galaxy on a faraway planet, I worked in uh, uh, fashion for a little while, and I had the limos, the fancy cars, the New York City lifestyle, and I remember sitting at this meal where more money was spent on me at this one meal than would feed a family of ten or something <laughs> and i'm going what am i doing here and you know there as i say there's people who go my god oh you're living the life it's so glamorous or whatever but it's shallow and then the older soul is looking for meaning 
So let's go from here. And I want to understand, I want to understand the journey for all of us. Did we come out of this this ethos, this amorphic beingness of source, of universe, of whatever we want to call it, get to the uh, causal plane, or go, I guess that would be the causal plane to the asked? Yeah, so I was going to say, so yeah, you're absolutely right. You're, you're coming from this kind of amorphous thing, this um, universal consciousness. Um, it's like a spark coming from a, a flame and then coming into the, the causal plane. And then from, from there, with a bunch of other souls, is, these ultimately become your soul family. Um, you come into the world at the same time. It's usually just a, you know, a bunch that will arrive around, around about the same time. And, you know, as I said, you will go between the, the earthly plane and the, the, the astral plane. You won't see the causal plane again until you're finished with, with all your, your lives. So you're getting all this experience. You're, particularly as an older soul, you're trying to interact with members of your soul family. It's not so important when you're a younger soul, but the older you get, the more you want to be around those ones that you came in at the same time with and share experiences, work on karma together and so on. Let, let me pause you there for a second, because I think this is important for everybody. It means, if I'm understanding right, just to translate, if you're feeling called to like group classes with like-minded souls or shows like this with like-minded souls, you are saying if you're craving the interaction with people who get you, that's your soul group that came through at the same time. How else are you going to meet them? You know, it's like you, you meet them through classes or you know, in the workplace or, or, or wherever, but we're drawn all the time. You know, we think we're going one place for an education, but it's what's driving the choice is more the people you're going to meet, the souls that you're trying to interact with. Yeah. So you get to the end of it. You become a spirit guide. You you have more experiences on the astral plane, you go to the causal plane, you reunite, and then back into the, the universal consciousness. What, what you're doing through your experience on Earth, you're growing, you're growing, you're growing, and you take that awareness and you bring that it back into the universe. The universe is all about growth. Everything is about forward movement and growth, and you become a part of it. I mean, it may seem like it's a very, 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 very small part, but the analogy the spirit guides gave me years ago was that it's like um, you've learned about love. You go back into the universe, and it's like putting a, a, a dropper of food dye into the ocean. You know, you won't see anything. It will dissipate. But if millions or billions of souls are doing that, it starts to change the color. So this, this leads perfectly, thank you, right to kind of my big picture understanding, the world according to Michael, according to Michael and Michael's guides that I play around with, which is that you and I, and, and you are clearly my level 10 brother, so you and I are cells in the beingness of humanity. We may have an older soul age relative to me, we're all one, we're all the same, whether we're at the beginning of this journey or an end or wherever on the journey, all one. There is a beingness of humanity that my guess is, is going through the same process as within, so without, as the micro, so the macro. There is this human beingness that has an age and is going through the same process. Scary question, but where would you put humanity in the scale of levels? We're roughly halfway, at some sort of halfway mark. You know, it just, we, we have a predominantly level five consciousness, which is shifting. That's actually an interesting question because we're undergoing the transformation is what my spirit guides call it. And this is a shift in consciousness. It's the first big one we've had since we got the kind of souls that we have now roughly about 55,000 years ago. And this is happening over, you know, it, it'll happen over a few generations but it'll happen pretty quickly. It's already sort of picking up speed. You know, people talk about the shift, transformation or whatever. It's all the same same thing. But it's it's um, an increase in consciousness of what we're seeing at the moment. Because a lot of people will say to me, oh, my God, look at the, all the chaos in the world. Uh, sure. But what we're seeing is a little bit of a, a reaction from younger souls who are, you know, faced with this shift in consciousness. You know, they're, they don't know what to do with it. They, they, they don't have the experience. You know, they go, oh, my God, these people are woke and that's a bad thing or whatever. You know, it's it's a lack of understanding. And so they're resisting it. 
And uh, that's creating chaos right now. But we will come out of this. Your mission, I'm guessing, same as my mission, elevate consciousness, raise people's vibration, shift humanity. That's, that's my mission statement right there. Can we, everybody comes through and they start at the beginning and they work their way forward. However, can we have a tipping point? Doing the work you're doing, the work I'm doing, I'm playing with that term that I was mentioning earlier, resonance, where we are all starting to wake up a little sooner or vibrate at this higher level that we can help people along more quickly so that all of human kindness can evolve faster. Yes, absolutely. Because we do it through example. You know, we, you know being an old soul. Uh, people are always asking me that. Well, what, what should I do? But a lot of it is just about being yourself. You know, be an example to others. Be a kind, good person, you know. And uh, that in itself helps to elevate the consciousness. Are there signs of soul maturity? The signs that your soul is really starting to, to get it. Uh, well, that thing about recognizing that we are souls, all souls, acceptance of of, of of others, like I was saying at the beginning, that would be sort of the big one. Now, that doesn't mean that when you look at young souls acting out, causing wars or whatever, that we go, oh, well, it's just young souls doing what they do. It's not about accepting in that sense. Um, we still want to teach them, you know, like to say, no, 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 this is not what you do. There's, there are better ways to, to act, to be a really conscious old soul. Um, you, you know, you need to act in a more peaceful way. I think that would be the, 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 you know, the big one really. So let's go from there and let's talk about empathy for a minute, because I know that everybody who's attracted to my work, my guess is everybody who's attracted to your work, is what we call an empath. To me, an empath is actually, we have a school called the School of Mystics, and, and I train what I call MITs, Mystics in Training. Every empath is a mystic once they understand their sensitivity is actually here to feel their way through the world in a different way. What can you tell us about empathy and the old soul? Well, that's actually part of the journey, you know, where I was saying it goes from, you go from fear to love. Um, it's really about an opening up of this empathy. And that you, you could see that as the difference. Like the old soul is going to be naturally more empathic. Now, you can still get broken old souls. You can still get old souls who are not empathic. And um, you can get narcissists who are extremely old souls, for example, uh, who will target empaths. It's, this is something I've actually created a project around. Uh, it's been a theme of my life as an empath. I've been, uh, unfortunately, bullied a lot by narcissists. Um, I've drawn them into my life and, you know, vice versa. It's a bit of a two-way street, unfortunately. But empathy is its the way we should be. Now, one of the things that um, sensitive old souls hear a lot is that they're too sensitive. And I always try to correct that and say, no, you're highly sensitive, and that is a great thing. How else are you going to... Um, develop your intuition, for example. You know, it's um, we need empaths, and it's I, th I think it's a tragic thing that empathy is often seen as as weakness by younger souls, and it's actually it's a it's a superpower. I love that. Yeah, it's, you're coming from a place of strength. The project that I was working on, I talk about wounded empaths. These are empaths that carry fears from past lives, and once you heal those fears you become incredibly strong. It's just about developing boundaries. I'm so glad you're mentioning it because I can go back to your history and I'm going to raise my hand here. I can go back to my history as well where you and I dated what I'm going to call Hoovers. <laughs> <laughs> vacuum cleaners who sucked away all of our energy and said it was, I don't know about you, but I was certainly told it's my fault. And my guess is you were told it's your fault. So you're saying narcissists can actually be old souls targeting empaths. Can you share and explain? Because I want to protect our audience. I want to protect your audience because as an empath, we're like puppy dogs of the world wanting to help and heal everybody. There's a little bit of an Achilles heel there. Um, you're seeing the soul beneath the surface, and sometimes you miss the, the, what might be obvious to another person. That this person, or there's something wrong with them. But you go, oh, you know, I um, said so the empath, I can, I can fix them, I can help them. You know, so you draw these wounded puppies in. The interesting thing about narcissists and empaths is that the, the narcissist is very, very fear-driven. They have a lot of fears. In fact, 
technically speaking, they have at least 12 fears. They have all the 10 fears that I, I list in my books, uh, plus two others. And what it means is that you as an empath will be targeted by them depending on what fears you carry. So if you have a fear around judgment, hypersensitive to criticism and, and so on, say, well, the narcissist has that fear as well. But the difference between you, the empath, and the narcissist is that you internalize your fears. So the judgment, you beat yourself up. The narcissist externalizes. So they have a fear around judgment and they will, they will recognize it in you, not consciously, but they will go for you. One thing I say is that the narcissist doesn't. They don't create the wound. They find the pre-existing wound. They stick the knife in and they turn it. So if another example is if, you, if you're dealing with issues around low self-esteem, this is a fear of inferiority coming from past lives. Well, a narcissist has that. But again, you will internalize it, feelings of low self-esteem, um, imposter syndrome, lack of self-worth, but they will externalize it and they will put you down and keep you there as much as possible to boost themselves up. Uh, a functional human being doesn't, doesn't do that. You know, you don't have to push other people down uh, to boost yourself if you're, if you're a functional soul. So they'll always find that, that fear. But they, they smell it like a shark smelling blood in the water, and they're attracted to it. You know, here's somebody I can really take advantage of. If you heal your fears, then they, they swim right past you. They can't smell. There's no, there's no blood in the water. And they move on to something else. Thank you. So let's go from there. And I, I want to do a reading in a little bit, if you don't mind. But before we do that, and maybe this will lead into the reading, you were mentioning past lives. How important is it to understand our past lives, to understand why? Well, let's use an example. If you have an a irrational panic over something, you can't make a decision. We joked about surf and turf at the beginning. There is no way for you to decide if I'm getting steak or fish, or in, in my case, you know, tofu A versus tofu B, so to speak. What's going on here? How much do those past lives matter? The past lives explain everything. I mean, I, I don't think there's anything about human beings that isn't related to past lives in some way. Your entire personality is chosen before you come here based on what you've learned in past lives. All your fears, phobias, limiting beliefs, all of that is past life related and can all be healed by exploring past lives. The indecision, uh, you know, I joke about surf and turf was invented for people with this fear. So, you know, if you're like the kind of person you sit down in a restaurant, you look at the menu and you just can't choose. It's like, it's, it's, the world is not going to stop revolving if you choose inappropriately, but it can, it can feel like a big deal. Um, it goes back to a past life. Technically it's a past life fear of death. And it's a, it's a past life in which you made a decision that led to your death or the death of others. Maybe you, you said, uh, you know, it would be a nice day to go kayaking. And uh, somebody says, you know, there, there's a storm brewing from the east. And you go, oh, you know, no, it'll be fine. Come on, everybody, let's go out. And you lead everybody out on a kayak trip. And you all get in a storm and you drown. Your soul will then feel responsible for what happened. You know, you, you should have maybe listened to somebody else. Um, you should have paid attention to the weather. Um, and in this life, it shows up as... Usually it's two things. It will, it will be a feeling of uh, around, issue around responsibility. So either being overly responsible for other people's happiness and well-being or sometimes not wanting any responsibility at all and indecision because your soul loses its faith in its ability to make a wise decision because of what happened in the past. So you find the past life and the, this is the wonderful thing about past life work. Your soul is on life number one. It doesn't die between lives. You might be on life 120, but it's, on, it's still on life number one and will be always. Let me pause, pause you for that because that's such a big deal what you just said because you said there are two challenges the soul has in your book. And one of them is that it does not distinguish between any of these lives. That 5,000 years is one life to the soul. It's a, an amazing thing because 
what the soul needs to be reminded is simply that that was then, this is now. Let it go. Whatever you're holding on to, whatever fear or block or limiting belief, uh, even physical ailment, um, you just have to find a past life and uh, tell the soul. Um, and it's this is why I'll be working with somebody. This has happened a number of times. There's one I talk about in the book with the uh, there was somebody who had been beheaded in a past life. And I, I said, well, this usually translates to neck and shoulder pain, in my experience. And it usually heals up uh, pretty quickly. I'd say usually within a couple of weeks, you'll notice a difference. This is providing it's not a present life issue, um, you know, and there's no guarantees. But if it's a purely a past life memory that's being held in there, uh, and be- beheading will do that. What's the exercise they would do if they've been if if you're getting continuously shoulder and neck pain and it relates to and and I don't think we actually have to correct me if I'm wrong no we can just take a guess hey this could be a beheading and that's enough to play with because chances are with the number of lifetimes you've lived we've all been beheaded a time or two exactly well it's it, unfortunately more common than we'd imagine you know if you look at past lives I and mean, we you know, common form of execution in many parts of europe but up until very recently um so th- this person i was working with uh, she's actually a ballroom dance teacher and she was talking about in her work you know she has to look around and you know move her neck and shoulders all the time and 20 years of chronic pain disappeared in the moment literally as we're talking about it um she's turned up at events that i've done It's gone completely. It's never come back. And um, uh, what happened, you know, it's just that the soul is reminded and in that moment goes, oh, right. So that's a past life thing. Thank you for reminding me. And it just lets it go. I mean, that's a dramatic version of it. Usually these things, you know, my experience, it can take a few days or a few weeks. Um, A lot of physical ailments. Uh, Last year, I worked with two people who had been dealing with psoriasis. One person, she's 59 years old, had been dealing with it for 57 years. since she was two years old, but the past life cause, it disappeared. Uh, psoriasis disappeared. Um, she's t- she, she called me, like, I don't know, it was a month later, and she's going, you know, I'm wearing shorts for the first time in my life. I'm looking at my legs. And I can't believe it. You know, it's like these things are, you know, they're life transforming, obviously, and I, I just wish more people knew about this because, you know, some of us go through our entire lives dealing with things, you know, these challenges that could be could be uh, eradicated very, very quickly. I always do stress, you know, this comes with no guarantees, and, but things like fertility issues can be related to death in childbirth in a past life. I've helped, oh, I keep saying, I, I've helped a couple of women uh, to get pregnant as my assistant who said you need to find a better way to <laughs> express that uh, but i mean through past life work just reminding the soul I and mean, as i always say it's not with a not with a bang you know it's not like a spectacular thing in the soul going oh my god thank you it's just like okay great good let's let's move on it's just not so much a bang but a whimper i teach a process called automatic writing where you can go in and speak with spirit speak with soul speak with a, a, a akashic masters whomever you want what to you is the simplest way to be able to gain access to our past lives so that we can scroll through the Rolodex and go, oh, that makes sense. This is why I'm experiencing X, Y, Z today. Yeah, I think the the, the first thing would be to understand how the principle, you know, um, because you know, uh, I mean, check out the Old Souls Guidebook, for for example, where I talk about you know, my other books. I mean, I don't mean that as a commercial, but, you know, that would be this. It's okay, Ainsley. This information is important. So it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have a past life regression on a recording, which you can find on my on my website. And uh, I, I would start with that. I think doing, doing a little regression on your own. This is something, actually, I, I led a regression uh, last night, and I was pointing out that you don't have to be something special to do this. You know, like we can all do it. You just, it's just a lot of it's about quietening the mind, allowing your spirit guides. We will, we all have them, allowing them to come in and then just say to them, you know, I'm dealing with this issue. Maybe it's like doctors can't help, or I've tried therapy and doesn't seem to get over it, or I always seem to, other things, patterns, you know, I always seem to get into this, you know, I always seem to have angry bosses, or I always seem to, you know, this issue with uh, sex or whatever it is. 
talk to the spirit guides about it. Say to them, show me the past life or past lives that are related to this. And then just go into a, a meditation, or just which is basically nothing more than creating some internal and external tranquility. You do not have to spend 20 years learning to be a Zen master to do past life work. You know, we can all do it. But, you know, what I always stress is that people don't put time into these things and they don't create the tranquility. There's so many people in this busy life the world that we're in, they wake up with noise. It can be, you know, the alarm clock, the radio, the, they've got the TV on, or having breakfast, they're off to work, there's chatter, there's noise. They uh, come home and they have the TV on the moment they walk into the house and then they go to bed and, and wonder why they can't hear their spirit guides. You know, so a meditative practice, just, you know, even if it's just 10 minutes twice a day, that'd be ideal uh, to get started. Um, of just finding a quiet spot and just calming yourself down. This, um, as the spirit guides always say to me, if you take one step towards them, they'll take two towards you. But it's very hard, very hard if you've got a lot of chaos in there. And oh, automatic writing and things are really important. Journaling, getting stuff out of the mental hard drive so that it's easier for the spirit uh, world to work with you. Thank you. On that note, it, and it's definitely a world to me that it is, it is designed, I'm convinced it's designed for our evolution and, and it's designed with op opposites. Uh, spirituality works to me with paradoxes, the opposite side of the coin. You want to quiet your mind, you're going to be giving a louder environment. You want to elevate consciousness, you're going to be given more of a challenge. <laughs> it's always playing with that opposite. There's a, there's a fun one that I want to dive into here that um, a lot of people who listen to the show experience. And, and I can see it as a fear of death. I'm wondering what you can tell me about it, the introvert. This is actually a choice. It's part of your life plan whether or not you're an introvert or an extrovert or ambivert or where you are on a spectrum. It is a spectrum. And this is something that the spirit guides describe as a paradox or the, the paradox that they call it. And the paradox is um, that you have two missions and the, we all choose from several missions or a bunch of them, uh, there are 10 in all, but they, they just help to give a little bit of a focus to this life. One is uh, a mission of connection and that's to make sure that you connect with other people or other souls. And uh, the other is a mission of avoidance. And this is uh, where you, you want space to connect with spirit. You, you need quiet downtime. So most of the people that I work with have a paradox where they have both of these going on. It, and it is paradoxical. Connection, avoidance. And they have that push and pull. So it's very, very common to have that thing where you are – you need to be with people, but if you're with them too much, you need to have time on your own. If you're on your own too much, you need to get back with people. So a constant push and pull. Now, I talk about my wife and I uh, in this context because although I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty uh, sort of quiet guy generally, and most people would see me as as an introvert, but I'm actually an extrovert. I have a full mission of connection. I recharge around people. I love parties and social occasions, deep conversations with people and everything. Now, my wife can be one of the funniest people, uh, outgoing and everything, but she needs loads of time on her own. She's actually an outgoing introvert. And, uh, you know, we have this fun thing for the last 15 years or so, um, at least until COVID, I, I would go out every Monday night with the boys for, for dinner. And, uh, I would always do the same thing, you know, like I uh, should be settling down with a with dinner and a glass of wine to watch Game of Thrones or whatever. And and uh, I would be saying, you're going to be OK in your own. And she's laughing because you go like, you know, I'll be fine. And I, I'd say things like, well, I won't be long. She could take as long as you like, you know, she <laughs> loves having the place to herself and that qu quiet time. Whereas leave me on my own for 15 minutes and I'm kind of going, who can I call or who can I talk to? <laughs> it's like, uh, I, I need very little time on my own. How much on the other side of the veil do we choose our personality, our plan, what's going on here? Well, we spend, um, we spend a lot of time 
this is part of the, 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 the processing after, well, really after the processing of life we just had, the next thing is, okay, what do we still need to learn? What do we want to do? And your entire personality is chosen before you come here. And it's chosen from, uh, you could think of these as archetypes, these soul types. So let's say, uh, for example, uh, a little bit of reading of you. Now, you've had a lot of lives as a singer, dancer, actor. Uh, you've been working through a number of past lives on issues around self-expression, really learning to speak your truth um, and be more in the spotlight. You know, this this would follow lives sometimes when you maybe were uh, where you didn't have the opportunity to shine. And this time around, particularly this lifetime, you're meant to have a lot of fun. This is something the guides um, <laughs> flagged before, before I called. Um, they said you're really here to enjoy life because you've had some pretty austere past lives where you just, you, you know, uh, it didn't work out as your soul had, had intended. You know, this is one of these myths, you know, people say, oh, you know, wherever you are, this is just how it's meant to be. And it's, it's so disempowering. No, you know, things go wrong when we get here. We want to, we, we should be, you know, getting back on our, our life plan, you know, and not just going, oh, well, this is just how it is. I just got to suck it up or, or whatever, you know. Um, so you're here to have a lot of fun and bring that to the world. You're here to learn to really speak your truth and you're doing it. And one of the things is that you're focusing on stuff that's a little woo-woo. It's a little bit out there. And that actually push, pushes you a little outside of your comfort zone, initially anyway. And after a while, you know, you find, oh, you know, I'm not going to get persecuted for my beliefs like I was 200 years ago. And uh, you become more confident in, in, in what you're saying. Well, it's, it's funny that you call yourself a, re a reluctant psychic because as I went down this journey and I've had two near-death experiences, which certainly gave me more than a glimpse of an understanding of, of the other side. But as I dove into automatic writing and then the guides are telling me you need to write a book on it, I'm going, whoa, 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 you got the wrong guy. <laughs> I, I use the term reluctant psychic because I was really fighting against it. Um, it was... You know, I, I kept hearing from psychics that I should be a psychic. And I, was, I, didn't even, I didn't know how you even start, you know. And, and it was the feeling of like, I think you may have the wrong person there. And a huge fear of, of public speaking. I, I mean, I didn't want to be seen. I played in bands all my life. I was always the bass player hiding behind the drummer. You know, it's like I was like, even with my back to the audience sometimes, you know, it's like, oh. Uh, um, and, and, and these were all past life fears that, you know, eventually I, you know, overcame and allowed me to to put this stuff out into the world. But the reluctant psychic thing, I, sh I shook that off fairly quickly by doing the past life work and uh, really embracing it. Even using the term psychic, I was so reluctant. And what's your license plate? P5YCH1C, which looks like a <laughs> psychic. And that was that was really helpful, you know, when. Yeah, it was, it was a gift for my kids, you know, like, um, it, and, and my initial reaction was, oh, my God, oh, like, you know, people are going to think I'm such an egotist or whatever. But it was just, uh, it, it, but it helped me to embrace terms like, you know, when people would yell at me in the street, are you really a psychic? I go, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, when I first started doing the work, um, I would mumble it, you know, so people would go, what, psychotherapist? <laughs> no, no, psychic, you know. Um, and it was like almost a feeling of like, oh, God, you know, why have I been chosen for this? You know, but once I got over the fears, the only thing that gets in the way of any of these things is fear. You know, so once I got over that, I was, I was able to embrace it and really go for it. And you touched on, you know, the experience I had in Hawaii with my my uncle. This is where I was. I was on a trip um, and I'm wandering around Borders Bookstore in Lahui and Kauai and uh I was in a totally altered state. It was really weird. I was going, what is happening here? I was, it was really unsettling. And uh, first weird thing that happened, I didn't put this in the book, but it was, um, I was going, I really don't know where I am. And I just reached out and I pulled a book out of a, out of a shelf. I didn't even know what topic it was. I opened it up. And, it's, and the first thing I looked at, oh, yeah, it's the first page I looked and right in this paragraph, are the names of my parents' two closest friends. And I went, what the hell? 
And I looked at this is a book about um, paranormal experiences. It was the guy, Han, Hans Holzer, I think his name was. He, he was checking out a, a ghost um, appearance that somebody had had, but it was a Scottish ghost. And the only Scottish people he happened to know were, were these friends of my of the family. And uh, so uh, I'm going, well, that is really weird. And I put the book back and I just walked a couple of feet and then I ran into my uncle, which was very surprising because he'd been dead for about 10 years at that point. This was actually just after a psychic had reminded me yet again uh, uh, that I was meant to be a psychic. And she even mentioned my uncle by name. And uh, he, he just appeared there. And he, he was only there for like a second, but real, you know, I mean, it's not like a, oh, you know, fuzzy apparition. This is like, boom, it's like literally having somebody three dimensional and real there but for a second and then it's gone. But the, but a message which was much longer and it was about working together with him. And I had heard that probably from four psychics, you know, your uncle John is on the other side. He wants to work with you. And you know, he, like me, had been a non-believer, and you know, I thought he'd be the last person to do that sort of thing. And we, we didn't work together for very long. I mean, I, I just, I mean, I, it was another week or so, and I waited till I was back on, on the mainland, and um, I just thought, well, let's give it a try. And I just said, okay, John, you know, if you're there, let me know. And we just had this very um, hesitant and very stumbling conversation. It was not, it's not like now. It's like a, like a very easy connection I have with the other side. Then it was like sticky. But he passed me on to the spirit guides that I work with now. And that was, for me, that was the, oh, my God, that was the proof of the, the whole thing. You know, I mean, I went from from being, well, really atheist and, and not so much skeptical. Maybe I, I mean, I had some openness, but I think there's a cynicism there. And it completely changed things. I mean, it made me really aware that was something so much deeper, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I still have to remind myself sometimes I have that moment where I go, holy cow, I spend my days talking to invisible entities yes. <laughs> on another plane of existence. Oh, I and, teach, I, oh, I'm looking at the clock right now and it says three, three, three. And, and to me, those repeating digits, angels are, are, are saying they're here. I'll teach a class, my, my school of mystics tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, I will wake up, Ainsley, I'll wake up. And I won't have any idea what I'm teaching tomorrow night. And it still scares the everything out of me. And I will go and I will sit down. And within about half an hour, I have an entire outline syllabus, <laughs> all the key points and everything. And I'm going, thank you. They're there for us, aren't they? they absolutely. I've had it where, where sometimes I'll be, you know, planning a class or something and I'm, st I'm sticking and I go, oh, my God. How am I not? I've, I've got spirit guides. What am I? Why am I doing this on my own? You know, it's it's always. I think the important thing is to recognize that all of these things are a collaboration. You know, providing you're doing something that that is, you know, it's in everybody's highest interest. I mean, they're they're not going to help you to start World War Three. They're you know, or um, plan somebody's murder or something. They're they're here for the 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 good of all. You know, but providing your intentions are good and. Um, they will support you in every way they possibly can, you know, opening doors, you know, even that thing of noticing 333, um, that, uh, that is literally there. What they're doing is they're drawing your attention in that moment and they're saying, we're here. So let's go from there. If you don't mind, I want to cover two more things and then we'll do a meditation. I'll grab Rue the rooster and we'll, we'll do a meditation. First off, you mentioned that you started to get information before the show. So I'm wondering if you can do either a reading on myself or a reading for myself, my wife, and our unborn baby, whatever you feel called. And then I want to make sure that we cover soul personality types so that people can get more of an understanding of who they are. Because I feel the more we understand where we came from, the more we understand who we are, the more we understand our soul mission and can rock it. One of the important things uh, for you is that you're here to overcome that um, issue around self-expression. The big past life that is related to that is that you were a Native American kid, little, little boy. Um, I don't know the circumstances, but it was an interaction with soldiers. And you were crying, you were wailing, and one of them cut your tongue out. 
um, sorry, I should come with a trigger warning, but, um, you know, but seriously, but very dramatic. And, and of course, that goes to self-expression. And, uh, and also there'll be issues around the, the throat chakra as well. You always get that with any kind of self-expression issue from a past life. Um, so you're here to heal all of that. You've had a few lifetimes where you've been doing that, like I was saying earlier, singer, dancer, actor, those sort of lives. Now, what you've chosen is a performer um, soul type. It's very strong. Um, and this is about reaching an audience. For podcasters, this is wonderful. You want to have that there. Most most podcasters that I've uh, I've been interviewed by have it somewhere in there. You have it front and center. Um, it gives you the sense of humor you have, a little bit of goofiness, um, if you don't mind me saying, but in a good way. I mean, I, I'll, I'll own that. <laughs> <laughs> I resemble that uh, remark. <laughs> you, you certainly do. Um, uh, and here's the interesting thing: is you need an audience. And so many performers, they get this message that it's wrong to want to be in the spotlight. But that's what you're here to do. You know, you cannot be as effective do, talking to five people every time you do a podcast as you can if you, can if you talk to five million. And the performer in you will always seek an audience and they will always seek more bang for the buck. It will always think. Well, if I can reach 500 people, I can reach 5,000. If I can reach 5,000, I can reach 50,000. Hmm. If I can reach 50,000, I can reach 500,000. It's always thinking, well, how do we expand? It's trying to get whatever you're doing out into the world um, as much as possible with, in a way, the least effort. You know, it doesn't take any more effort to reach 5 million than it does to reach 5 people, uh, maybe in terms of marketing or something. But, you know, you're, you're doing the same podcast so that is a very very fundamentally important part of you you also got some you've got the spiritualist in you very very strongly of course which is why you're so interested in spirituality um, and why that's such a big focus of what you do um, there's the leader in you as well you know and uh, uh, you know you're here to use that authority as well every podcaster who's interviewed me in the last three years I find this utterly fascinating Every single one that I've talked to, and it's not to say that every podcaster has this, but you're working through a past life fear of rejection. And this comes from abandonment in past lives. It will make you feel in this life or at times like a little bit of an outsider, like you don't fully fit in. But how you heal that is to belong. Um, the more you belong and you don't get rejected, the more healing there is. But uh, what the spirit guides describe as the elevated way to heal that is to be the uniter, is to bring people together. And that's what I found all these podcasters are doing. And you're no exception. You're creating a place where you're bringing the, the, the soul family and, and those who suffer, uh, particularly those who feel like outsiders, you bring them together. It's a spiritual act. And a spiritual act is always one where you heal yourself by helping those who suffer as you once did, whether it was in this life or a past life. So these are super important things that you're, you're doing. Um, now, what your, your unborn child is going to want from you is uh, very much related to some of the stuff here. Um, learning to, to be expressive and learning to uh, be comfortable belonging overcoming the, the fear of rejection because what a wonderful way to do that to come in, into a family where it will be recognized the importance of really being there for that soul making that soul feel like she's just loved and cared for nurtured it will heal perhaps centuries of rejection so that's going to be uh, very important and uh yeah, you definitely got a, um, an outgoing performer on the way. But that's a very common thing that the 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 child soul comes in wanting to learn from the the parent. So it'd probably be quite a, quite a lot that's shared with mom and dad that the you know that this child will learn this from you and this from mom. Um, very common. It begets an interesting question: How much of these things are 
familial wounds versus past lives. And I'm going to use myself as an example. So one of the wounds I've been working through this lifetime, and I'd love to know if there's a past life specifically related to this. One of the things I'm working through is what I call affectionately the screw up gene. And I put that in quotes, that no matter what I do, I'm not doing it right. I'm not doing it good enough. It's not exactly the perfectionist. It's, it's maybe the other side of the perfection coin of, am I going to mess things up? And I've gotten much better with that. But I can see it in my mom tremendously. I can see it in my dad tremendously. I can see it in their parents tremendously. And I also don't really want to gift it to baby Hannah who's coming in. No, that's interesting. So, the, well, there are a couple of fears playing into this. One is a fear of failure. Um, where things have there, there's been a pattern of things going going wrong, and then you get triggered because of the family. You know they can easily pass down these these fears. If you ha- uh, you would have to have the past life fear, otherwise you wouldn't be triggered. But but yes, it can be triggered down generations. And inferiority is the other. One. That's the really big one. You you're working through self worth issues in this life, and th- there's judgment as well playing into it. Yeah, so those would be the three major fears. Because the judgment is, uh, that comes from something in a past life, like being judged and executed, perhaps, you know, at court of law is typical, or maybe being judged for the color of your skin or your religion or something. Um, like I was saying earlier, the, the old soul tends to internalize these things. So you've got inferiority, you've got judgment, you, t- you tend to uh, beat yourself up. And, uh, you know, uh, it's a little bit as well, sometimes you need to change the focus because it's so easy to to focus to see that pattern and then think, oh well, you know, here we here we go again. But you're not a victim of circumstances, and you can shake these things very very easily. But Such a, a lot word. of it, yeah, a lot of it is really, you know, just developing self worth. Now, obviously, it gets easier as you get older. You know, it's like uh, you're you're not going to have the same issue that you had even five years ago. It's not going to be s- strong. It, it'll it'll and certainly with the spiritual work that you've done, it's it's going to dissipate anyway. But uh, you know, you want to go back to really clear out these things fast and make sure that this doesn't get passed on. You want to find a past life where you were treated as lesser if you like you didn't matter, and that would be the I almost use the term the downtrodden servant, you know, something along those lines. Uh, you want to find that's the inferiority. Uh, you want to find the the time you, that we were judged and it led to your death. Um, could be part of a massacre, pogrom, or something. So that's uh, that's a judgment one. Um, and then you want to find usually more than one past life where things did not go according to plan, where you got taken off your life plan. That's failure. Your soul can usually deal with one life every so often that goes wrong but when it detects a a pattern that's the you know then it has that expectation okay things are probably going to go wrong again can't uh we can't guarantee you know you don't like you lose that confidence that everything is just going to be fine or you can have the success that you can have and everything i've done a past life regression and 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 it's probably a little bit fuzzy at this point and i may be combining two lives there's one i believe of a samurai which things didn't work out there is another one where i was a monk seeking enlightenment and i was so frustrated at the end of my existence that i hadn't achieved enlightenment i felt like you know i had been a um, celibate monk <laughs> what have i done with my life i've ruined my life how do I take that knowledge that's come out of a past life regression and then go back there and heal this wound? Well, a lot of it, like I was saying earlier, it's just about reminding the soul that that was then, this is now. But the cognitive part is, you know, this is why writing is so important, you know, to, um, to explore how this would, uh, would show up. Uh, one of the things there is that in a past life like that, there is no, spiritually, there is no reason for being celibate. That's just religious dogma being imposed on you. And so, yeah, your soul gets to the end of that life and goes, <laughs> I've never got laid, you know, and oh, what a bloody waste of time that, <laughs> that was. You know, so it can teach you about, you know, really important lessons about 
um, sp for example, spirituality versus religion. I mean, you know, a lot of people muddle those things up, but they're, they're, they're very different. Um, it's, it, the older the soul gets, the more it's, it tends to see the difference. Now, you can have religion and spirituality, but they're not the same thing. Um, and the older the soul gets, the less the dogma uh, speaks to it. You know, like um, the old soul is more likely to go, well, you want me to be celibate? Hell, so why should I do that? You know, there's more questioning and, and so on. The younger soul just go, oh, that's the way it is. You know, it's in this book somewhere or somebody told me this is the way it's supposed to be. New soul, rigid, old soul, much more flexible, much more questioning. How do we tell, since we're talking about relationship celibacy, how do we tell if our partner is not at the same soul age as us? Oh, boy. Well, I spent a few years with a young soul um, back in my London days. And uh, it, it was, oh, my gosh. I mean, it, it, I made a lot of decisions based on lack of knowledge, huge past life issues, low self-esteem, you know, past life in inferiority, playing into a lot of stuff that had happened in this life. And I ended up making some poor relationship choices. And this one was with somebody who I didn't know about soul ages at the time. If I had known, it might have, it might have helped me. Um, but our values were completely different. And that's where she knew to fake it, but it was not genuine. And, uh, you know, and after a while, I'm starting to go, oh, this, this person sort of she just really doesn't see the world the, the way that I, I do. Um, far greater self-interest, for example, like I was saying at the beginning, you know, it's often a sign of a younger soul. They're much more sort of self-absorbed, self-interested. And in extreme cases, like this person, will throw somebody else under the bus to, for, for financial gain or whatever. I think you really need, I think if you, if a lot of it comes down to values, so, you know, how, how you see the, the, the world. And I mean, there are, there are core values. You know, I talk about this uh, in my books that there's, uh, you know, peace, truth, love, understanding, justice, uh, equality, cooperation. And it's like really looking at, um, let's say, how does your, your partner, the person with, you're with, how do they compare to you? You know, when it comes to truth, you know, the old soul is, you know, you can tell an old soul sometimes, especially if they're working through some issues around self-expression, where they tell a story and then they, they go, well, you know, it, uh, it was last Thursday, I was um, walking along the road and I ran into somebody and they go, oh, no, wait a minute, it was Wednesday. It doesn't matter from, you know, it doesn't in terms of the story, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't matter what day it was. But they correct themselves because they've got to get get it right. The truth is so important. My wife yeah. is the truth police. <laughs> <laughs> I am a storyteller. The fish tends to get a little bit bigger, but not with my wife. <laughs> that, that, that is a performer. My, uh, in fact, the uncle I ran into in the, the bookstore, he was a leader, with, uh, but he had a performer influence, amazing charisma. And... Uh, uh, you know, he used to joke about how he would never let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> and I realized I was telling stories that he had told me to family members and then going, you know, that didn't really happen. And I go, oh, <laughs> no, I didn't know. I did, but it was a great story. A few last things and then, then I'll, I'll go grab Rue. Can we tell if our children or are our children typically the same soldier age as us and, and the the personal flip side to that is, is there a way to tell about baby Hannah? Your spirit guides will help you to, uh, um, get the details. You can literally do, you know what I'm saying, just go into that quiet place and just ask them to say, what, you know, what can I, we expect here? Just get a picture. Even what you can do is ask your, your spirit guides to um, take you five years out. So she's five years old. What, what, what do things look like? What, are, what is she interested in doing? You might, it could be like you just say to spirit guides, okay, show me something that, that Hannah will be doing in uh, five years. I, I, get, I already get that she is so advanced, that she is so much smarter, not head smart, but has so much more of an understanding at age five than I will have at 55. People use different terms, you know, indigo children or whatever. You know, this is, there, there are, as a, this is part of the transformation. These old souls coming in, 
uh, with this higher level of consciousness. And it blows you away. I mean, my kids are, they're now um, t- well, come, just coming up to 21 and 22. And uh, from, the, from the get-go, I've, I've been going, my God, they've got so much greater self-awareness than I had at that age. You know, and that, it, that's, uh, uh, I mean, it's still, I find it mystifying. How come they've got, got things together so much more than, than I ever could have? But that's part of this transformation that's going on. So, yeah, she'll be teaching you. Um, you know, but I was going to say you you can get from the the spirit guides. You know, they'll they might show you. Uh, it can be little images, like a, a, a I'm just you know, making this up. I mean, you you see what you get, but it might be just a a ballet two two or something like that to say, oh, it's you know, maybe dancing is something she'd enjoy doing. Get little um, glimpses, but they can give you little sometimes little sort of metaphors almost to 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 help you understand. Uh, they will give you loads of help there because, you know, you are look, obviously you're going to be a conscious parent and, uh, you know, you're such an old soul. Uh, to go back to the, that thing about uh, old soul parents and, and old soul children, um, what I found is I've been doing this for 25 years re- reading people. And I don't think I found any old soul parents with a young soul child. However, I have found plenty of old soul children, well, my clients, with young soul parents. But the big significant thing is that they often start off with the, the family. Let's say, you know, they're your younger soul parts of the world. You know, like there's tends to be, you know, broadly speaking, you know, that the, the coastal big cities are going to be a little bit more old soul. Um, rural Alabama, for example, probably a lot younger soul so you know i have a client who is an old soul raised in rural alabama with these young soul parents but then left to college or whatever and is now living in new york or or whatever there's a key word that has been a theme coming up I, it's been a theme in almost everything over the last week and i do a lot of a lot of channeling in a week so that's a that's a lot of stuff um victimhood and 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 the concept that you may well be an old soul born into a new soul family, but do not place yourself in the role of victim. You actually chose that on the other side, and it is here to serve you. We're exploring this in my Soul World membership program this month. This is the topic of the, of the month. All right, tell me more. And I did not mean it this way, but perfect. And tell me where people can go to find your program and find out more. Well, people can go to soulworld.com to, to learn about our membership uh, program. Uh, yeah, this is a fascinating thing because we are very, very rarely any of us victim of circumstances. And we often feel that. And this is a past life issue again. This is the interesting thing about from our past lives, when we've experienced unfairness, we have this belief in this life that, you know, we, uh, life's not fair. And, you know, we, we have, you know, one thing after another happens. We go, oh, you know, life's not fair. That can be a, a, a disempowering belief, but it can also be an empowering belief. It seems paradoxical. Now, for most of the beliefs that come from past life fears, you've got the negative belief and then you've got the positive and they're sort of very obviously diametrically opposite. You know, I am not worthy compared to I am worthy or whatever. And uh, But this is the interesting one because the disempowering belief and the empowering belief are the same. It's just how you do it. So if you go through an experience and go, uh, life's not fair in a sort of poor me kind of way, uh, well, that's true, but it's not getting you anywhere. But if you acknowledge in a more positive way, life's not fair. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make it more fair. I'm going to do something about it. Then that's empowering. Because life is not fair. You just have to look around. And you can't con the soul. You can't say to the soul, this is why a lot of affirmations don't work. You can't say to the soul, oh, life's fair and everything's good. It's all sort of sweetness and pink elephants, you know. Um, Souls are not going to be fooled for one second by that. On my wife's birthday this fall, I went for a bike ride. She was pregnant with twins. And I got hit by an SUV on my bike and broke a bunch of bones, ended up in the hospital, surgery, blah, 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 meaning I'm not going to go play with the story. And then a couple weeks later, we lost one of our two twins. 
I could go, poor me, woe is me. Poor me, woe is me. Please tell me, oh, you poor thing. And I'm not bringing it up for that reason at all. I can also take the role of the superstar, which I'm encouraging everybody to do. Lick your wounds. My God, man, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. But then realize that your choices you make now, sort of like a company that screws up. It's not necessarily a bad company. It's what they do about it afterwards. It's what you do after the poop just fell, the flaming poop just fell on the sky out of you. That makes all the difference. It's always about how you turn it around. Uh, because that is the, the reality that happens, you know, uh, it's just part of being here. And if, if you go into that disempowered place, uh, poor me, um, that, that helps no one. But if, and you said something really, I think is so important there. And that's about licking your wounds. You have to, to, to just go. Well, everything's just fine. It's toxic positivity, which is, you know, total. Um, the reality is you have to go through. If you deny your emotions, you're not helping yourself. And the funny thing is, I was actually talking about this in a class last night that um, I, I do these classes with my wife. And she was pointing out that uh, she's known me for 10 years <clears throat> and she sees how quickly I, I recover from any kind of setback. It doesn't set me back for more than a very, very short period of time. I immediately go into, okay, how can I fix this or, or change things? And what I was explaining is that with when you do the, the work, particularly when you do uh, past life work, one of the, the changes that happens is that it's like a waveform. So you go, it's easy to go down and deep, deep down into the trough of the wave and stay there, stay there a long time and then eventually come up. You know, you, all this time licking your wounds, feeling poor, being whatever. But if you get into that mindset where you say, ah, oh, you know, this really, the, oh, life's unfair and I, you know, oh, I'm mad about this or whatever, don't deny the emotions. But the waveform will change when you, when you get into that mindset of, now, how can I fix it? it? The wave goes like this, down, and then you come right back up. But, but to, to just coast and not go down into at least a little bit of licking your wounds is just toxic positivity. You're, 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 not, you're denying the reality of the situation. It's changing the waveform by saying, okay, uh, this has happened to me. I'm pissed off. I'm hurt, whatever. Now, what can I do? To, to change things. Don't go into that, oh, life's unfair. There's nothing I can do. Can't change anything. Poor me. Thank you so much. And, and that's it. I, I, you, I'm going to say almost you compress the waveform. You can spend your whole life skimming along. You're just slowly sliding down because you're not facing it versus drop off the edge of the cliff, <laughs> hit that bottom in a sense, and then you're going to rebound much quicker. If you have a resilient mindset, you know, something uh, Dr. Carolyn DeWick talks about, if you have that resilience, that growth mindset, you can then shorten the curve and come back on the other side much faster. Yeah, absolutely. But you do have to lick your wounds and acknowledge it. You know, even just stomping your foot and going, life's not fair. Let it out, you know, express the, the emotions. Thank you so much. Any last words that you want to share, Ainsley, before I go and get Rue? Uh, I would just like to repeat that everything about us, everything about we humans is past life related. Reincarnation explains everything. And the more you learn about how these things work, it's by healing the past lives that you really are able to go forward in this life and, you know, achieve all the things that you're, you're meant to do. It's like, it's like, what is it? Um, releasing the ball and chain from around your ankle or some kind of analogy like that. You know, we're all dragging these, these blocks and issues from past lives around with us when we don't have to. Thank you. Just to riff off of that real quickly, I, I want everybody to get your book. I want them to get the old soul guidebook and everything that you have. Look for your triggers. Your triggers are going to point to past lives. If somebody points a plate of food of you at a restaurant and something's off and you flip out. 
<laughs> there's probably a reason for it. You didn't just flip out. Watch for what your triggers are. Do the work. Look for where it comes from. The tr- absolutely. The, the triggers explain it. Absolutely. Perfect. So where's this Rue? All right. I'm going to go grab him out of his soft kennel. Be right back with you, Ainsley. Lifelong friend that we're just meeting again for the first time. This is Rue. Hello, Rue. <laughs> A handsome guy. You hear that, good boy? <laughs> you are. You are. So would you mind leading us in any meditation of your calling? Absolutely. Let's do... Uh, <clears throat> we'll do a little forest walk Sounds here. Sounds perfect. So, all right, if you'd like to just take a, a deep breath and close your eyes. And I'm going to take you to a very, very beautiful place. It's a little uh, wooded area. We're going to go through a little gate. So I want you to picture yourself. It's like a, it's a pastoral area. Um it is at all times safe. There are no um, animals with claws, teeth, uh, or sharp beaks. <laughs> There's, um, you're totally safe on this little walk. And what I want you to do is picture yourself starting to walk on this grass, look down, recognize that you, you're in bare feet. You're feeling the moss and grass, maybe you're feeling a bit of the dew and on your feet. Um, looking at uh, your body, you're maybe wearing a tank top or a sleeveless shirt. You, you feel the sun, feel the warmth on your skin. You start paying attention to some of the sounds, like birds singing, and maybe the rustling of the leaves in the trees. And uh, Looking at the colors, you know, beautiful you know, birds in the trees and beautiful flowers in the ground, beautiful color in the sky. And beside you, there's a little stream, a little babbling brook. And I want you just to start following this in the direction of the water. And then a little bit ahead, there's a small wooden bridge. I want you just to step over the bridge onto the other side and just continue along feeling the ground beneath you, feeling the warmth of the sun, listening to the sounds around you, noticing the colors, noticing how calm, peaceful this walk is. Just keep following the direction of the, the water. As you go around in a long circle, it starts to realize you're sort of starting to go back to where you began. And on your way back, there's just another little bridge, maybe cross over that. Um, again, just feel the difference in, under your feet from the grass to maybe the, the wood of the bridge. Again, just notice anything your breathing, the sound of your breathing, maybe you're panting a little bit after this walk. Again, there could be sounds of birds, sounds of wind rustling through the trees. And uh, just ahead of you, you notice that you're coming back to where you started this walk, feeling relaxed, calm, just at, at one with the world. Beautiful sense of peace. There you are, back where you started. And just, once again, just take a deep breath, and then when you feel comfortable, just open your eyes. This is a quick meditation I do for myself. Um, usually just spend three or four minutes doing that. So you can take this walk, you can go anywhere. Just make it your own. And the rooster is down. 
<laughs> you calmed, you tamed the Rue. Ah, <laughs> uh, thank goodness. I didn't know if I had good rooster karma or not, but it's like I do. You do, and he's definitely, he's having a little bit of a wired day from last night's class, as I was mentioning earlier. So, they're protector animals. And so if things are off, they notice, and it's a low pressure system that just came through here. And they're always watching the weather. They can feel it to make sure they're taking care of their flock. And so he's on a, a heightened state of alert today. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, oh, bless. Well, thank goodness he's got you and a calming energy there. And vice versa. So thank you so much, Ainsley. This has been truly beautiful and a treat. And um, your work and message is so important because one of the greatest diseases that we have today is it is as it is. Things just are the way they are. But we, un we understand where they come from, why they're here, how they can be, if we choose to, be here to serve us. To use what you said earlier, we remove that ball and chain from our leg. To me, that means everything. And it's recognizing that we have the power to, to create change in our lives. You know, we're not, you know, we're, we have a life plan, we have a, a destiny, but it's not carved in stone. And uh, we always have the, the ability to shape the, the journey. Woohoo! So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the old soul's guidebook and discover the old soul in you today. And above and beyond all else, shine bright. Woohoo! What do you think, Rue? That was a really special show, a really special interview with Ainsley McLeod on past lives, on Are You an Old Soul? And because you're watching this today, it means, of course, you are an old soul. On that note, he spent a lot of time talking about it, communicating with your guides, finding out what's going on on the other side. For that, I can't recommend enough. Do you want to point to it, Rue? <laughs> oh, the automatic writing experience. Of course, you can get the book, but you can get also live classes with me every month and an entire video-based program at automaticwriting.com. And because you're an old soul, it means you're a mystic. So come join us for our School of Mystics and meet other like-minded mystics at inspirenationuniversity.com. Of course, we're a podcast. You can listen on Spotify. You can listen on iTunes, wherever you ingest your podcast. If you click the subscribe button and the bell icon, you'll be notified of upcoming shows, YouTube premieres, live events with me. Click the join button down below to become a member of our mystic circle. You get daily videos, you get behind the scenes goodness, you get lots of extra bonuses and goodies and videos that you don't get anywhere else to help you on your path, to help you to grow, to help you to become the mystic you were meant to be, including behind the scenes videos with Rue, of course, along with Jessica and myself. Simply click that join button down below Here's a link to the next amazing video. Love you guys so, so much. Big thumbs up. Leave your comments if you love this. And above and beyond all else, keep on shining bright. How does it get any better than this, Rue? How does it get any better than this? Love you guys.